and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a couple newcomers into the temple. They are the double-headed monsters that compose 13th Moon Games and developers of Coven and Crucible. On one hand, you, ha you have Roach sitting in the red corner. And <laughs> on the other hand, you have Steven sitting in the blue corner. It's Stefan. Hey, Stefan. That's all right. How red versus blue, I love it. How you two doing tonight? Doing really good. Uh, thank you for having us. Outstanding. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm doing all, I'm doing all right. Um, I'm once, I'm once again applying the rule of thumb that I have with weather in my state, which is if you don't like the weather, wait ten minutes. <laughs> also, my theory that Mother Nature is on drugs. Which drugs? But yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Or just, or just use the list of drugs that Hunter S. Thompson brought with him to Vegas. <laughs> uh, now, a bit of a tradition around here, besides the drinking, of course. What are you drinking tonight? Um, Castle Danger. I have no idea what that is. It's a, um, Castle Danger is a cream ale that's Got that? Um, is local to min local to parts of Minnesota. Nice. Yeah, because there's there's no shortage of pub crawls in any place in the Midwest, and well, my where I come <laughs> from true. is no exception. I just refuse to do the zombie pub crawl because I'm not messing up a perfectly good suit. <laughs> Yeah, we're outside of Chicago and uh, close to uh, within two hours of Milwaukee, so we are absolutely aware of the pub crawl and the uh, drinking that must be done in order to survive being in the Midwest. <laughs> oh. you, although even I have my limits because there is so, some stuff that is too bitter even for me. I believe you. And the funny thing it the funny thing is I always hear somebody say monks don't monks don't drink. I'm like hmm. Not hey. true because they brew, because there's plenty of monastic orders that brew their own beer. Yes, and mead and wine and all sorts of other stuff. Plus yeah, I can't mm -hmm. I I'm pretty certain that yes, there are monks who drink. Well, there's the Trappists out in um, Belgium. There you go. Besides, when you're out, when you're out in the middle of nowhere, you take you take up new hobbies. <laughs> yes, like gaming. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but with that in mind, I'd like to oh, I'd like to go into the humble beginnings as I often do. So. For both of you, I'd like you to walk me through your introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I had no idea about uh, role-playing games when I was growing up. I grew up in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming, and it, I didn't get introduced to uh, RPGs until I went away to college. And I got my first... Uh, system was Pathfinder. Actually, no, I take that back. My very first system was Rifts, but we never actually got past the making a character. You have my part sympathies. of. Yeah. Uh, so we did. I got introduced to Pathfinder, and um, it took me a while to get used to the idea of like, wait, so what are the rules? You you just play a character. How does this work? And um, once I got the hang of it, I was like, okay, yeah, I like this. And I spent um, 
many, many years just mostly playing whatever anybody else was playing. I was the party filler, so I, everybody else would play, pick their characters and their classes and races, and I would just be like, okay, where do I need to fill in the gaps? Um, and it wasn't until actually a couple years ago in a campaign Stefan ran where I came to my true calling, which is to play a bard. Um, and then after that, since then, I have been running playtests for Kevin and Crucible, but I also ran a couple other games, and I've learned that I really like being a DM. I like being a storyteller. It is a lot easier than being a writer, a fiction writer, in many ways, because uh, I don't have I can come up with the beginning and the end, and I don't have to worry about all the uh, uh, squishy middle stuff. The players can worry about that. And for me, for me, it was the summer of 1979, and I was at a friend's birthday party, uh, and they had the Atari up with Defender on it, and people were playing that, and then the table was set up in the basement with uh, the red box D&D, and I was like, this is pretty neat, and then... At that point, I started playing, and then that, that whole weekend, I, all we did was play D anD D, and I was hooked. And then um, a year later, I started running when I was uh, when I got my own red box and blue box, and then the black box and the silver box or whatever. I don't remember the colors of that ones, but anyway, uh, and I've been playing and running ever since. Mm -hmm. uh, it, funny story though, um, Roach and I met actually at a live action role-playing event and where we met and got together mm -hmm. this is true now with that with that in mind since it, it sounds like the two of you have done a done a fair amount of system hopping over the years oh yes um when it came how did the idea for covenant crucible um, come to be? Um, it started with me. Uh, it started actually years ago. I watched the movie The Last Witch Hunter, uh, which is not a good movie, but is a great movie in that popcorn uh, kind of way. And I was like, man, this would be a great setting for an RPG. And that just kind of sat in my head for years. Um, and then a few years ago, I got introduced to the John Wick trilogy, and it just kind of, I was like, this would make a great setting for an RPG. And all of that had been percolating in my brain for uh, forever, and Stefan has often been the forever DM, and at one point uh, I thought, you know, it'd be really great if there was a game that I could run that you could play in, but I don't know a lot of systems. Um, I'm only comfortable really running one system, and even that I'm not that great at. Uh, and so I, I asked him, I said, do, do you want to take our relationship to the next level and write an RPG with me that I would then run and you could play in, and then you wouldn't have to be the forever DM anymore? <laughs> I, of course, immediately said yes with no hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> because who wouldn't no in the right mind? <laughs> I had no idea about mechanic. I, I was like, I don't know what it'll be mechanically. I don't know any of this. I just, I have a setting in mind. And uh, I knew that Stefan is very good with mechanics and very good with, he always, for the longest time, would do what I said uh, was he would do my homework for me. So he would always update my character sheets because I'm just all about the RP, uh, not so much about the stats and everything. And so I figured, you know, between the two of us, we could probably put something together that uh, that at least worked for our purposes, and then it kind of like ballooned from there. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, something that something that I will admit I will admit I found I found a, I found a bit interesting, if only because of a certain meme that I I inadvertently started that won't die. Is using to, is using D twelves. I say Dude. a meme. I, I say a meme that won't die because I had pitched an idea a long time ago of do of doing 
a of doing a parody of the of those P, of those PSAs. You know, for just four cents a day, you too can help it can help a lonely D twelve find its home. <laughs> yes, exactly, and that yep. that's that's exactly right. <laughs> the only reason I didn't go through with it was like was because I couldn't find an actor to do the voice right. Ah, and I'm <laughs> not doing it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was all Stefan. He's the one who I'll let him talk about that. He's the one who came up with all that. Well, very much for the reason that you had said, uh, and that you had brought up the the meme that just won't die, is because D twelves hardly get any love. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm like, well, what could I do? What could we do to? Bring this like how could we idealize this? And I'm I'm familiar with you know a a, a whole bunch of systems, mm-hmm. and like what can I do, and how could we work it so that we can use D12s, and that's uh, and so we we played around with stuff, and I mean and this we started this was back in December, yeah. I believe in December when we when when she when she proposed to me again, and then <clears throat> and. <laughs> And that was when we started working on stuff and then um, playing around with mechanics and playing around with uh, different systems. And that's how, when I said, well, let's do these 2D12, what can we do? Well, 2D12 generates a number between 2 and 24. Um, it's really not good for um, like a D20. We don't want to, and we don't want to copy like a D20 system or anything. So, um, but I did the one thing. The one thing, not to not to bring the G word back into this, but uh, the one thing I did like about that system is that you had to roll underneath a number on a certain number of dice. And I'm like, well, hey, why can't I do that with 2D12? And there it was. And that's how it was born. And then we've kind of been building and building, and, and we came up with a skeleton for it. And then start, we're starting to flesh that skeleton out now. And, and now we have this... Um, I, I would like to say diverse and robust system to accomplish any number of tasks. Mm-hmm. So that's how it started. Yeah. So as I under- I always try and understand the Ro- the Rome and the All Roads Lead to Rome um, instance with the game's mechanics. Mm-hmm. Um, and since you mentioned ro- you mentioned rolling under, is it a case where you're where you're trying to roll under a sum, or is or or is it success based a la two d twenty? Uh no no um <clears throat> you are correct it is it is you're rolling under a sum um and I can I can go into a bit of detail if you'd like yes all right so uh the we have created what's called a formula mm-hmm. uh, which is uh, much like you would think, an attribute uh, plus a skill plus a subskill, mm-hmm. and um, so there are uh, we have a cert- four attributes, and then we have certain skills, uh, and then we have uh, we have nine skills, and then under each of those skills are seven subskills that are kind of associated with that skill. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that it, and then so that creates just a plethora of options, um, while not being extremely complex, because you have just the main four attributes. So then, what you do is you we say, okay, the, I want to accomplish a task. The storyteller will say, all right, well, here's your formula. It's this attribute plus this skill plus this subskill, and you add those together and you try to roll under those on two d twelve, and that's essentially it. Um, uh, that's the basic static role. Do you succeed? Do you fail? You just try to roll under that. Now, there are modifiers, obviously, um, based on situations, based on, um, you know, oppositions, things like that. But for the most part, that's the core right there is you get the formula and you try to roll underneath it on 2d12. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that in mind, Mm -hmm. um, are you doing some sort of extra effect if somebody rolls snake eyes or rolls double twelves? <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Um, so uh, I'll have to talk about degree of success in a second. The degree of success is not 
what people think it is. People think, oh, degree of success is how much you succeed in the role by. And that's not what we're using. Um, because it's possible to generate some really astronomical target numbers uh, because of modifiers and magic and things like that. Um, but you, the, the degree of success is essentially whatever sub-skill that you are using, whatever level that is, and that, that level will range from 1 to 7. Whatever level that is, that is your degree of success plus modifiers. So um, because the more skilled you are at something, at a particular focus, the more likely it is you're going to, you know, do well at it. Um, now, the magic number in Covenant Crucible is 13, as you might have guessed. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you roll a 13 <clears throat> and it is a success... Uh, based on what your target number is. If you roll a 13 and it's a success, that is a critical success. And generally, mechanically, um, if it's a degree of success-based roll, then you'll double your degrees of success. So a 7 becomes a 14, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty awesome. Um, if you fail, however, it is a critical failure. So if your target number was a 12 and you roll a 13, that's a critical failure and bad stuff happens. More often than not, it's a storyteller fiat type of thing where the storyteller will get to do some flavor thing and it'll be a really awesome epic tale that people will tell around the tables for years to come but for the most part um a 13 is either a critical success or critical failure depending on what the modified target number is does that make sense yeah perfect now whenever i'm glad that you mentioned that the amount of skills and sub skills that you have because a question that I often, often bring often bring up in these kind of things is the issue of analysis paralysis. Um, yeah, I hate to keep picking on Shadowrun when it comes to, when it comes to this kind of thing, but it's <laughs> it's. Uh, but as I, as I find myself saying, I'm not here to hit a man while he's down. I'm here to kick him because that's easier. <laughs> because nice. Shadowrun is my go has been my go to example for years of. How, of how to take a skill system too far. Oh. There's other examples, but that's a, that's a bigger one that people that people are more familiar with. Because if I bring up Phoenix Command, nobody's gonna know about that. I, I don't. And then they'll then they'll read it and, and they'll realize why Phoenix Command has been my whipping boy for so long, right alongside GURPS. <laughs> oh. But. <sighs> Given, but given the fact that it's a that's a smaller it's a smaller setup that answers that that answers that question. Um, um, if I could, there is a there is a. I mean, when you first look at it, you look at the character sheet and you see there are sixty three total sub skills. That's a lot, right? But they're all organized in groups of seven underneath each skill. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a reason for that. And there's a reason people. And people will look at the character sheet and they'll go, I only have this many points to spend. What do I do? How do I do that? And I think Roach can answer this question much better than I can about specializations. Um, yeah. Uh, 63 is a lot, but I, I need to point out that when we started off, there was like 140 something because I had just sat down and just listed out everything I could think of. And then I provided my list to Stefan and he was just kind of like, um... Yeah, you, you, you need to pick less sub-skills. Put a few of those back. Uh, but the idea behind the game is we really want to encourage people to form teams. Mm -hmm. uh, we want people to f create characters that are specialized. So rather than throwing a whole bunch of... Doing a spread so that you may have like one level in a whole bunch of different sub-skills... Uh, we encourage people to instead spend their levels in uh, very specific, like choose two skills that they think would be really important to their character. And then under those two skills, then put most of their levels uh, spread across those sub skills because the idea is really kind of, uh, I got the idea and I've used it from things like leverage and like Scooby-Doo where everybody has a role to play and together as a team, you can do amazing stuff. And so uh, 
that way it encourages teamwork, it encourages RP, and uh, that Stefan created a very uh, short and succinct char- guide on how to create a character so people don't have that um, paralysis that you were mentioning of there's so many things here, What, where do I put my levels and how do I make this work? Um, because the mechanics for me are supposed to be there to support the RP and support the world, uh, I, not to be there just for mechanics' sake. Mm-hmm. Now, given the given the fa- given the in, given the inspirations and given your background, um, one thing that I found kind of interesting is the fa- is the faction work in your neo noir take on take on Chicago. Um, just out of curiosity, you've probably gotten this question asked in the past, but. Were any had any of you played any any game in the World of Darkness line um, during development? We I'm... are that the work that we met each other at was a we were both members of uh, Mind's Eye Society, and the LARP that we met at was a um, vampire LARP. Uh, and in fact, the one system that I feel confident enough to run and which is my favorite game ever is changeling the so lost. the lost yeah not the dreaming the lost um so yeah yeah we we have played uh world of darkness <laughs> i'd i think i i figured two things one there was some World of Darkness DNA in this, because, especially because of the factioning. Two, it wasn't mage because this ga- because this game isn't ridiculously OP by by, by your description. <laughs> <laughs> it is not, no, but it is. Um, it has done some really wild and awesome stuff. Yeah, you... the um, the DNA, like the inspiration, at least on my end, that I took. Uh, or that I was inspired by World of Darkness was actually in uh, certain things that they've done, like their um, specializations. We have a in our system we have a thing called traits, uh, which allow you to get the modifiers that Stefan was talking about that can modify either your target number, which is your formula, or your degrees of success. And I always thought it was really cool to have. Things that you could add on that not only are uh, mechanically helpful, but they have a flavor to them. So stuff like we have a trait called cowardice, which if you take it, it adds to your ability to dodge because you're a coward, you're going to run away. But it does mine it. It, uh, it gives you negative modifiers to other uh, sub skills and um I've tried not to. We tried not to do too many traits where it has. You have to do that trade off. But um, I just like this idea of having these modifiers and these traits. And I modeled uh, kind of the idea off of specializations that you get in World of Darkness. Um, the faction portion of it, the the houses, actually was inspired by the idea of guild houses and gangs. So guild houses uh, from, you know, early, late 16th century, early 17th century, where you had your uh, apprentice journeyman master uh, who were in some sort of professional guild sort of thing. And then also you would have these gangs where they would have their own territory and turf and the things that they would uh, concentrate on. So that was kind of the inspiration for the house structure and that kind of rivalry there. Um, of course, when you meant when you mentioned gangs, my mind immediately goes to the warriors. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Classic. Yep. I'd, I'd be lying if I said I didn't use the come out to play line to to me, to mess with people. As as it should be used. But I think 
the big the big reason that I that I that I figured that ma that mage wasn't a, wasn't a factor is um mage among even among the world of darkness games has a bit of a reputation for for being the game that that um is very good at butt fucking reality. I, I could see that. I, I have played one mage game in my entire life, and I spent a lot of time going, wait, what? My point, you can do my what? point is, is, that, is, that you, is that mage games can get stupidly overpowered. That is uh, very much a concern, or has been a concern for us with putting this game together, is how do you keep it from being overpowered? And a lot of, that was one of the things that doing the playtest was super helpful with. Uh, one, because our players would come up with these ideas that were like, huh, yeah, you, you could do that in this system. And then having the talk through of, okay, how do you keep this from being something that is like way overpowered? Uh, as an example, we have a player who will um, put people to sleep where his whole thing is if I'm going to be going into fight, it would be better just to not even have to fight them. So he has cast a spell in order to put people to sleep. And we've had to have discussions about, okay, if you succeed, like how long does the sleep last? And that's where we have brought in our degrees of success saying, okay, then that person will be asleep for a number of uh, turns equal to your degree of success in that. Um, so we've really tried to build into the system uh, not only breaks to keep it from being stupidly overpowered and broken, but also to give um, both players and storytellers the tools they need to tailor the game to their particular table. Because everybody, every table is different with different player needs and desires, and so we want to have a robust system that helps uh, allow each table to have the kind of game that they want to have. Mm -hmm. And speak, I think that's a good enough time to delve into the way you guys are, are going to be utilizing magic. Now, there was that quote at the top of the Kickstarter page about, ma about magic being work. From that, could I infer that magic is treated as a skill? Yes. In fact, there is, uh, of the four attributes, um, one of them is magic, and then there is this, the skill magical, uh, under which there are the sub-skills. And it is. It's treated as a, um, like, computer programming or singing or performing or any other kind of uh, activity that requires some effort. And because of because of that, when it comes to ca when it comes to casting spells, the first question that I'd have is, do you guys have a set, have a set spell list, or do you do you have a system that you're put that you're putting together where people are creating their own spells? It is the the way we have the system set up is uh, there are the actual mechanics of the formula you need to roll but we leave it up to the players to basically decide not only what that magic looks like like we have one uh player her character is a journalist so when she casts a hex her hex looks like a um cryon like the cryon on the bottom of a television screen um Basically, it's a very loose system allowing for players to flavor it the way they they feel appropriate to their characters and to the system. Um, there's no set spell spells or anything like that. We I have created um, some examples of what you can accomplish spell wise, and I also created some uh, example like magic items that people can make, but. Otherwise, it's meant to be very open, uh, again, so that it's flexible and people, you know, if you want to have a really horror-like Neonor, or if you want to have 
goofy that you can do that um, just utilizing the mechanics that we have provided. Mm-hmm. Play off of that, um, the import- it's the importance of, and I've created a flowchart for actions, but the, the first thing that's important is that the, the, person, the actor, the person who is making the action, uh, dates their not only their action but also the intention of the action. So that way, the storyteller can come up with that formula, um, but also the player can then say, "Well, I want to do this spell, and I would rather use this subskill." And there's a there's a small moment there where they can present a different option, and the storyteller can say, "Yeah, sure, that work," or "No, that, it wouldn't work because of this." Mm-hmm. Um, so we've created that level of flexibility, but it's the important thing about magic is you're stating your intention because that's it, in magic that's important so um there there's no like wrote said there's no magic missile there's no lightning bolt but there are spells you could do that would essentially do that um but then there's also spells you could do that are for instance the the character who care, who just puts people to sleep he hexes them to sleep i mean it's not a sleep spell but it just this is the effect that i want my magic to have and it's you create the intention, you put it out in the world, and that's what happens. Yeah. Now, I, w- I wasn't expecting a lot of the traditional fantasy spells to be represented in something like this. <laughs> but what I am curious about is whether or not spellcasting traditions or methodologies are represented within the mechanics. Um, yes and no. Uh, a lot of the magic and the the theory behind the magic is very much informed by my own. I'm I'm a, a witch and a pagan, so it's very much informed by own, my own practice. And uh, so the sub skills that are underneath magic, there's um, alchemy, there's hexing, warding, summoning. There's a general just occult one. Um, Divination and forging. Divination and forging. So you have these seven sub skills that uh, are like alchemy is for potion making, forging is for making magical items, divination is pretty self explanatory, summoning the same thing, hexing and warding the same thing. Occult is like kind of our catch all for, you know, basically everything else, um, which then allows people to who want to specialize. We have a player whose character is a bartender who special she specializes in uh making potions that are also drinks mm-hmm. so she'll make a potion to help somebody with their divination and uh, i believe she she described it as a martini uh that had an olive in it so it looked like and it was set up to had been put together so it looked like an eyeball um, which is fantastic and creepy and weird, and I don't think I ever would drink that myself, but in game you can do that. And Okay, I gotta get one bad joke out of my system. Is that is Seth sure. Martini shaken or stirred? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I would imagine I, stirred. I, <laughs> I I was pretty shaken when she described it to me, so <laughs> it was it was pretty amazing. Come on, I had to do it. I hear you. Oh, it, I hear you. Totally. Absolutely. So you got to get the low-hanging fruit. <laughs> uh, and par- so I'd like to put that. I'd like to put that into practice. So if you if you don't mind, there's a few, a few kind a few kind of effects that I'd be cu- I'd be curious how they'd be interpreted within the, within this system. Some, sure. Some cl- some classic, some a little bit more um, esoteric. Let's say. So I like it. Let's start. Let's start with. Let's start with something simple. That being, um, object reading, i.e., touching an object and get and under and being able to perceive its history. Oh, that divination. would be divination. Absolutely. You would. What you would do is you would. So uh, let's 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 build this out as if we were in the game. So your character, the actor, would say the player would say, "I would like my character to um, grab this pistol." And find out when the last time it was fired and what happened the last time it was fired. And so these storytellers would say, "Oh, great, excellent! Um, if you're using it through magic, you're going to use your uh, your target number is going to be the formula of your magic plus magical plus divination plus any modifiers." 
uh, and so then the player would say, "Okay, great. I have I have my familiar with me, so the familiar is going to grant me some bonuses." Mm -hmm. And then they do the roll, and if they succeed, um, then uh, depending on what uh, what the ST has decided the difficulty would be, because sometimes there's a difficulty, sometimes it's just a static roll where it's a succeed or fail. Um, then they would give you uh, give you the details that you were looking for. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect. Now, I suppose an, another another one that I another one that I'd like to go, I like to go with. Um, Instead, instead of, I know a lot of people would bring would bring up would bring up fireballs, um. But let's say, let's say some let's say instead somebody wants to be be able to, um, channel electricity a la, the a la their touch as a stun gun on steroids. Okay. That's that's easy enough. That would be uh, hexing? mad. Yeah, hexing. Magical plus magic plus hexing. Mm -hmm. Or um, the case could be made for uh, um, magic or, or agility plus magical mm -hmm. plus hexing. Or, or, um, or even magic plus martial plus hexing. Mm -hmm. uh, but essentially, so you can see there's a lot of diversity in there. So if you want to have a combat mage who's better at combat than magic, but wants to be able to do things like shocking grasp or it's just, you know, just for reference to the old D and D stuff. But, um, to do stuff like that, they could easily, um, really dump points into martial and magic. And then, um, the, the sub skills in the magical of like hexing and warding, um, and really just, you know, and they could present it like, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing this as an attack. Okay, cool. And then you can come up with the if it fits, make it work. Again, like Roach said, we want the we want the mechanics to support the RP, not hinder it. Okay, taking that taking that into account, um, there's the next two that I'd like to ask about are two sides of a sim of a similar coin. The first being if so being if someone is Akin to an exorcist, um, all about dr all about driving spirits away from a person or place. Mm -hmm. um, how how would that be handled? Roach, do you want to talk about the the game where we had the the ghosts? Um, yeah, no, it's um, so that would fall under summoning. Could also fall under occult. Uh, there could be an argument for that. We also have a subskill called parapsychology. So you know, basically, depending on what the character is and how uh, they want to present that. You know, you have a ghost you, who's sitting there being uh, obnoxious and needs to be uh, gotten rid of. Then the character would then roll again, magic, magical, and um, Summoning with whatever modifiers I had, like uh, Stefan had brought up, uh, having a familiar adds uh, to your role. Or they could even um, do just a standard occult if they don't have summoning. Um, there can be that can be flavored to that. Uh, and again, it's just a matter of here's my target number. I'm going to roll my target number. Um, the the ghost will have a response, so the ST has to roll the response. If the ghost succeeds in resisting being uh, exercised, then the uh, character would ha the player would have to take into account uh, a negative modifier based on what the ghost's uh, degree of success is. So you can end up with um, doing quite a bit of math, which is really funny for me because I was an English major, so math is a four-letter word for me. Um, but, yeah, it would... It, that would be the formula you would use, and that is what you would roll, and if you roll under your target number, then you succeed, and you can send that ghost back, or demon, or um, whatever else back to whence it came, uh, and all of a sudden, and do your whole, this house is clear. Uh, and 
the other um the other avenue that I would that I that I wanted to ask on is not too long ago I remember I remember playing um si I remember playing Scion which ended up giving me the, one of the big one of the biggest crash courses with vo with voodoo that I could ever have asked for <laughs> and one concept that I remember using a lot because I found it very interesting in in my time with it is that of the cheval a ri a rider okay um so I'm familiar hmm? I'm familiar with the concept yeah so I'm curious how someone might ha might handle that easy um, easy peasy yeah, it, it again, like we said, it would be a summoning. Uh, so again, or, magic or divination, oh, or, or yeah, or divination. Uh, I suppose. Although you go ahead and why don't you explain why that would be divination? Um, you know, if there's a thing that we haven't mentioned yet called uh, tag locks, which um, oh they're, yeah, they're essentially um, some kind of tie to a person. So if say um, I I know that I would like to see through. Um, this person's eyes, and I was able to collect a bit of hair from them, or uh, an article of a clothing or a pendant or something that was very, you know, that was definitively theirs. I'd be able to use that, and then that would give me a, an advantage. But also, it would give me a, tie, a connection to them, so that I could then say, "I would like to do. I would like to see through their eyes," and so then they could, uh, or I would like to see through their. I would like to sense through their senses, and then um, the story child would be like, "Okay, well, here's your. It's magic plus magical plus divination." And mm -hmm. well, you know, or, or the case could be made for other things too. But um, in the case of, I think, living people, I would say divination. Um, well, it's so, and it's so funny. This is where the game's flexibility comes in because uh, if I were a character who wanted to perhaps either have um, a ghost possess myself or possess someone else, then I would be going through the summoning sub skill in uh then summoning um because that skill is for not only summoning but also dealing with um supernatural entities such as demons ghosts uh genus loci that sort of thing and so that would be this the way i would go about as to you know summoning a ghost and then having them either possess myself or possess or possess my character or possess uh some other character so it's I think this gives a really good example of just how flexible the game can be depending, basically depending on what your intentions are and what it is you want to accomplish. Yep, exactly, which is why it's so very, very important to stress the state your intentions uh, with the action. So that way, this, we could say, yes, I want to I be able to, do you want to send a ghost through this person's, send, to take over this person, or do you want to look through their senses, or how would, and, uh, and it goes from there. So that's why... Um, it's important we made the clarification that you should state your intention clear so that way the storyteller knows what you're trying to accomplish. Not just by your action description, but by what you really want to have happen. Yeah. And that way they'll know whether or not that's possible to succeed or not. There might be something that would block it, either plot-wise, story-wise, or just mechanic. Mm -hmm. Now, we've I can inf given that you mentioned uh, magic being a essentially a type of skill, mm -hmm. um, and I was able to infer the basics on how, on how it would work. Um, I'd like to ask about the consequences if if it if you if the dice are not on your side when rolling when rolling for magic. That's um, a good question. Rope? Yeah, if it is, uh, mostly it's for most stuff. It's a succeed fail sort of thing, um, where you know if. If you roll poorly, like you roll over your target number, the spell just doesn't um, go off. But there's room in there, like we said, we have the um, 13. So if you roll a 13 and it's a failure, that opens up for the storyteller to then say, okay, well, you got blowback, or um, it misfired and hit someone else, or something like that. Um, there are in-game consequences in that... Uh, if you are casting a spell and you are being overt about it, or you're doing something like the one player with the cryon that is her hexing, and people can see that, um, 
if you try to hex someone and you fail on your roll, then that person, that the target of your hex, they will see that you were trying to hex them and then they can turn around and, and target you. So a lot of the co- consequences aren't uh, built into the mechanics, but they're open up mostly for the ST to then kind of flavor it and uh, say, okay, well, this is what happens. Um, so far, most of the magic that people have been doing in our play tests have been um, just things that would either be a success or a failure. Mm-hmm. So the, w- the way you describe it, it, so- it sounds like that there that there isn't the, there isn't something akin to spell to spell drain or something like that. No, there's um there are however things like we have uh built in things like uh potion tolerance that you can only drink so many potions before uh if you re- if you go over that limit then uh then it can cause side effects and those are basically kind of up to the ST to be like okay this is what happens and which allows the ST to either again depending on the what kind of game you're playing either go for the goofy like you know you turn green or go for something more serious like all right and now you're you're sick or you take a point of damage um we also have things like uh if you were to use magic on yourself too much like um one of the examples that came up is can you use magic to just get rid of your fatigue so that you never have to sleep well yes you can but if you do that too and too much and you're awake for too long you're gonna have issues with that so it's it's one of those where again it's it's more story defined than mechanics defined but there is the opportunity for having some fun RP and uh, consequences to you know spending too much time uh, drinking and then using your magic to sober yourself up Mm -hmm. and it's funny that you bring it's funny that you mentioned um, vampire earlier on, because what I'd like to cover is the is the presence of the masquerade in vampire, and I'm curious if there's a, if there's something parallel, because as you'll recall, the masquerade is basically the unwritten rule of don't dr- don't draw, don't get the too much attention from the humans, otherwise things could end up being very bad for all of us. Yeah. Um, is there is there a similar thing to discourage people from casting too openly? Um, there isn't. Uh, the way that this world is set up is it's very similar to the real world. Um, in the fact that uh, that for many many centuries, um, witchcraft and witches were kept uh, kind of secret. In that you know there still there were the the witch trials, there were witch hunts, and so it was kept pretty pretty quiet until about the late 16th century when you started getting uh, toward, towards the Enlightenment and it starts getting accepted as a kind of parallel science. And so in this, the modern setting of this world um people know about witches they know about witchcraft uh the same way they know about airplane pilots and uh you know singers on american idol um people go to diviners to get lottery numbers they go to alchemists to get love potions and the like um they're aware of vampires and werewolves or werewolves and shifters and the supernatural it's just for a lot of people it's not it's not really uh relevant to their lives um again to come back to this idea of computer programming that it's it's something anybody can do um mechanically we have a requirement that your magic's uh attribute has to be at three or above but anybody can practice magic and cast magic it's just a lot of people the majority of the people don't because uh it takes practice and effort it's the same reason why not everybody is a 
concert pianist or uh, a world famous artist or an actor in Hollywood. It's, you know, you have to have kind of the desire to dedicate yourself to the study of it. So there are laws. Uh, legally, there's, there's some laws that uh, legislate depending on where you're at. I mean, some countries completely outlaw magic. Um, some countries are just like, whatevs, we don't care. We've got our prime minister as a witch. Sure. Um, so it's it varies from culture to culture and country to country. Uh, in this setting in Chicago, there are some legalities and some laws against certain types of magic, but it's really kind of treated as, you know, if you use a hex to kill someone, it's treated the same as if you used a gun to kill someone. It's still murder. You're still going to go to jail if you get caught and convicted. So it's not anything that's really kept secret anymore, at least not in this Chicago, as opposed to maybe some other country where it may be considered illegal to be a witch. Now, with that with that in mind, I've t we've also talked about how in, in a lot of World of Darkness and similar stuff, there's a heavy emphasis on f on factions. So if nobody is an island; everybody knows somebody. Is that the case with Covenant Crucible? And if so, could you could you go into could you go into a bit of a taster of some of some of the factions that would be in this version of Chicago? Um, yeah, yeah, there is absolutely. Um, there there are a couple different major factions. Um, the two that are the big ones that are in the name of the game, Coven and Crucible, you have the Coven, which is a very corporate, uh, sanitized version. Uh, it, it's a corporation where they have witches join and you are a member and... Um, they have certain uh, advantages to being part of that corporation. And then on the other hand, you have the crucibles, which are these uh, hotels that provide sanctuary to witches and are very independent and uh, don't really get along with the coven. Mm -hmm. And inside, but on a much smaller scale, you have houses, which are basically like these gangs slash families where witches that come together um, for similar purposes so you'll have like the um the Berlins which is this ridiculous house where it's all men who basically dress up as Ren Fair wizards and are all about being over the top ridiculous in their language and in in how they present themselves because their whole thing is distraction and so while everybody is not taking them seriously and viewing them as kind of a joke that gives them cover to do their serious business of, you know, working behind the scenes and advising the rulers and government officials and kind of getting their, their power on that way. Um, you have another house that's called the Greek Triad, which is three smaller houses that join together and they're all women who their thing is all divination and prophecy and uh, social issues where they are using, they, they run a app called Delphi where you can basically, it's kind of like dial a diviner and you can ask questions and they'll, they'll do their divination and then send their answer back to you over your phone. Mm -hmm. um, and all these houses all have their own personal agendas that uh, may be in direct opposition to each other, or, you know, they may sometimes align, but for the most part, they're, uh, as long as people stay in their own lane, there's not trouble. And when there is trouble, they either go through something like the coven to try to adjudicate a... a uh, conflict between them, or they'll start doing kind of like proxy wars where they start fighting each other through either hired muscle or through other witches who are not affiliated with their house mm -hmm. uh, that they're like, okay, you're an independent witch. I want you to hex 
this person and here I'm going to pay you for that. Yeah. I think part of the reason I asked about the masquerade or or its equivalent is I'd be curious if there if there were certain understood rules of understood rules of conduct between between witches. Um yeah, well for example um people witches who are part of the coven I mean it's it's considered that you don't you're supposed to be getting along. You're not. You're. You're not supposed to be fighting each other. But it's very much a veneer. Um, the crucibles have a rule of hospitality where you can't. Uh, you can't harm each other on when you're in on the hotel grounds. Um, why, am there's, I, why am I thinking of the Continental? It, yeah. it, yes, that's that was the inspiration for it. <laughs> um, you know, I I will completely cop to having. Uh, having been inspired by John Wick, both in uh, the style and uh, some of the the setting that I then turned into witchcraft. Um, but it's, it's mostly, you know, there's this... There is... There are certain groups who... Um, there's a group called Dunseen who really dislike the fact that... Uh, magic and witchcraft have become so mainstream and would prefer if it would be kind of hidden again. Um, and you have uh, a group of witch hunters who are like, no, we really did not stop hunting witches just because uh, society moved forward. So there's there are definite um, risks to openly practicing uh, but again, as long as you're, as long as you're in a country where you're not going to get uh, thrown into jail for casting a spell, and as long as you don't break any of the laws of that country, it, there's not really it's it's openly practiced and uh, people just kind of accept it as another part of life. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the. I suppose if, I suppose if I want if I wanted to be a smart aleck I could I could ask since you brought up the the inspiration with the continental if there's if there are certain types of currencies or or the like that are exclusive <laughs> to different yeah. factions. If it sounds like there, I'm, there, it sounds are. like I'm hinting at the gold coins I am. The pentacles, yeah. Yes. No, we have we do have a thing called pentacles. Um the pentacles are not they don't work the same way as uh as the gold coins in John Wick do. Um, it is, but it is a deregulated currency. It's a witch currency, um, which, which is used to buy services and goods that are magical. Um, it's a leftover from the days when witches had to be secretive and couldn't, you know, you, you couldn't, you didn't really want to be paying money, money for you know, cash or whatever for items and services because that might get tracked back to you. So you use a currency that uh, if someone gets caught with the currency, well, they got caught with the currency too. So them turning around and then saying that they got it from uh, so-and-so, well, then why did so-and-so give that coin to you? It's, it's kind of a, it reflects a relationship that uh, the witches have and the expectations of, all right, I'm going to do a service for you that's magical. You're going to pay me in a coin that's magical. And we it we still have a little bit of plausible deniability. Mm -hmm. And with that, in, with that in mind, when it comes to... To if I may shift to character creation for a bit, are you guys going for a point by system, or do you have some do you have some sort of archetype system that you're building around? Uh, no, it is strictly levels. Um, we wanted to keep it simple and uh, and concise, and uh, keep it consistent across the board. So um, everything is levels. Uh, and then, so you look at your attributes, and all the attributes start out at a certain level, and you have a certain number of levels to apply. And then there are caps, so they they can only go up to certain, so they can only go so high. 
Same thing with skills and subskills. And then traits. Um, and then XP is all the same. It's just whatever the new level is you want to buy times two. That's how many XP it costs. So um, it's all simple, concise, and again, with this whole idea in mind of the mechanics support the story, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in with that in mind, since you mentioned you mentioned lev it sounds like you mentioned levels and you're do and you're doing point by. Oh. Yes, but we don't call them points. They do. We just call everything levels. Yeah. Oh. I think I think that I think that's where I was a little bit confused because when I think of levels, I'm thinking of lev a a XP threshold or the like, not um XP as currency. Right, exactly, and that's that's a thing that that can be confusing. That's um, uh, so yeah, just it's everything is based on levels, and then like it's not you don't have a level twenty or a level nineteen or a level eighteen witch. You have just I'm a witch. I just happen to have. Um, these attributes, and then they are as a, each attribute is at a certain level, mm -hmm. uh, and then each trait is at a certain level, and each skill is at a certain level. Yeah. So, yes, and XP, like you said, XP is essentially currency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's some that's something that I wanted to, I wanted I wanted to make clear. Now, with that with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind. Given the amount, given the amount of moving parts, and this again goes back to that whole. Um, I don't. Know, that whole that whole analysis paralysis thing, since you're aim since you're aiming since you want people to create specialists, as it mentions on the Kickstarter page. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how you pl how you plan on, um, guiding pe guiding people in terms of that specialization that's a very good question the the idea is that they would the, the care the player would tell us what type of character they want to make you know like let's say um and if they don't know um we can talk then we start talking asking them questions about like, what interests you what is it that interests you about this you know about the magic system or if you, do you want to even play a witch you don't have to um you can play someone who can't cast magic um uh, but you know, the, but then you're not going to be casting magic, but you can still use magic items. So uh, basically, it's just asking them what they, what type of character they want to be. Like somebody who desperately wants to play a hacker, cool, we can do that. Somebody wants to play a hitter, we can do that. Somebody wants to play a, uh, you know, a grifter, or mastermind, all of those things. We would, you know, guide them toward a certain attribute, skill, sub skill area, and then. That's where they would divest or invest most of their levels, um, and it's because it is uh, mechanically it's impossible to be a generalist in everything. Mm -hmm. There's just not enough levels at character creation. Uh, yeah, so, and this is um, build basically in the game. This is where you get it's the storyteller that needs to help guide. Uh, character or players through character creation but we do have we like i mentioned before stefan has written up a a brief kind of character creation guide to help people understand okay this is uh what you need to be thinking about like what kind of character you want and then break it down to okay then this is you want to put uh your points in these skills and these sub skills um but we also have we're going to be having uh npc NPCs that we will have in the the book that um, have their character sheets there, so people can look and say, okay, here's an NPC who is a alchemist, or here's an NPC who uh, focuses on um, divination, and they can see where those where the the levels are on that character sheet to kind of give them a guide. Um, I I know that. A lot of people tend to, especially when they first approach a new system, that it's easier for them if their if their hand is held a little bit for creating their characters. Um, the plan is to have 
a couple of different scenarios and encounters included in the book, which then can will have some pre-gens that people can also just take and um, change out how what would suit their own character desires. Um, so there will be there's a certain at least a little bit of hand-holding with the expectation that it's the ST who's going to be guiding players through making their characters if there's questions about, well, should I put all my points in uh, parapsychology, or should I put it in a cult, or should I put it in animal handling? Uh, I'm making an underworld kind of thug character, so like, where should I be putting it in, in larceny or in uh, forced entry, security systems? all of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I definitely appreciate it because the last thing, the last thing that, and that anyone wants is to ha to have to deal with, um, what I like to call a hand breaking or what my brother calls guy. Damn it. <laughs> um, AKA, AKA the reason the reason why the reason why most adventures games especially King's Quest will eternally be my whipping boy. Oh. Handbreaking was just a term that was suggest was just a term that was suggested to me as the opposite of hand holding. Right. Okay. Okay, I see it. Um Guy damn it is what is referred to on TV tropes. It's based. It's basically where the uh, where the solution is far too obtuse for it to be um, discovered naturally. And gotcha. point and click adventure games have been notorious for this over the years. Um. Yeah, I I get that, and and I understand. It's it's difficult. You get a new system, and you're looking at it, and you can feel overwhelmed at times. So that's one of the one of the things that we are going to be doing with the the core book is yeah providing enough examples plus you know going through and explaining how to create a character so that uh, so that you don't have that situation where somebody's just looking at the the book and going well this is this is too much I'm overwhelmed I guess I just won't play we, we would much rather uh, we want people to play, not to just have another system on their shelf that they then go, well, that was money well spent. I guess I'll go back and uh, make yet another D&D &D character. And, and to, to kind of jump off of that, springboard off of that, um, it's one of the, in helping people make characters, I've helped several make for the playtest. Um, one of the hard, the hardest obstacles to overcome is people feel guilty because it feels like they're min maxing, but there's no, there's no such thing as min maxing in Covenant Crucible. It's mm -hmm. impossible. Um, the idea is that you make a specialist, which is essentially like min maxing, but you're, but it's not called min maxing because you are essentially just I'm becoming the I want to make the best whatever I want to make the best hitter I can make with. You know these with the levels that I have, so of course you're going to put everything in there. So people started feeling like, well, sh I don't know if I should put all my levels in that skill or that sub skill. I'm like, well, of course you should. If that's what you want to do, if that's what you're going to focus on, then yes. Well, it feels like I'm min maxing, but you're not because you're making a specialist. That's the idea. So that's uh, that's one of the things too is that is overcoming that knee jerk reaction of I don't want to feel like I'm a min maxer. But mm -hmm. but there's no min maxing because we're all specialists. Yeah. And I'll I I will certainly I will certainly have a preference for specialists over um a bu over a bunch of generalists. Mm hmm Because if you have a if you have a if you have a bunch of jack of all trades, then you have then you have a bunch of people who are just going to be excessively mediocre. In their roles, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Even even someone who uh, who may have put a seven, in, let's say somebody who puts a seven in hexing, if they spread out their skills and attributes, you know, maybe they only have a target number of sixteen or seventeen. And rolling that, they succeed most times, but not all the time. Whereas if you have somebody who specializes in 
magic and magical and hexing, their target number is probably going to be 24 over time. And then that way, that way, whenever modifiers are applied, they're still going to have a high chance of success. Yep. Now, what are you now? What are you guys shooting for as far as the total page count? I realize this is one of those influx kind of things. <laughs> Um, right now we're looking at between 225 and 250 pages, um, but that depends on, like, I've looked at two different, uh, book sizes, like, there's the, the normal 8.5 by 11, uh, big hardcover size, and then there's this kind of smaller, uh, 8 by 6. That I've looked at that I'm like, oh, that looks a little cute. But for the the eight and a half uh, by eleven, we're looking at uh, about 250 pages um, with all of the content, the both the the player's guide and the storytellers, and then the artwork. Um, that's about where it's going to come out to. For me personally, I I can deal I can deal with smaller or larger page sizes. The only thing I ever ask of anybody is put in a damn index. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> we we all feel your pain. We all yes. <laughs> I um I reviewed, Absolutely agreed. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Shiver, but I reviewed that a while back and I gave them hell for the la for the lack of proper bookmarks. Ah. <laughs> yes. Even though I even though I've spoken with the guys and I li I like them, it's a case of I hold these truths to be self evident that all <laughs> men are cremated equal. <laughs> yes, um, it's it's funny because um, in my other life I'm a writer and I have uh, a couple books out now, um, working on my third. But my second book, uh, the big criticism of it is the publisher didn't put an index in. Uh, and people have asked me, why doesn't your book have an index? And really what it comes down to is I think I was just kind of expected that they would. Um, so I've learned my lesson and uh, we would we would absolutely definitely have an index in this book because how are you supposed to find anything then? I mean, table of contents are nice, but, you know, if you're looking for something specific without an index, then <laughs> well, if you want you're kind of lost at sea. If you want a case in point on how useless a table of contents can be as an argument, look at the table of contents in most White Wolf books. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, That's, yes. <laughs> we, 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 are, we are aiming for, for slightly more informative. <laughs> right. <laughs> more accurate. <laughs> yes. No double X pages. Uh, and, for what, and for what it's worth, that net... Navigation is one of those things that I will that is that is a hill I will die on. Um, mm -hmm. Probably 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 die standing up like I'm Ben K or something. But that's what that's also one of the reasons why I keep picking on um on riffs and pretty much everything from Palladium. Oh, yeah. I know <laughs> I know why the the table of contents was so chaotic for their work, but. Knowing what, but it, if um, if you get if you get crapped on by a bird, knowing that it was a pigeon doesn't make it any doesn't make you feel any better, right? <laughs> doesn't matter if I know what hit me below the belt, I'm still going to be reeling. <laughs> yeah. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto my show and enjoy the madness at play here. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, you so for, much having for having us. us. That was awesome. That was a lot of fun. I appreciate and it. Anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further discuss Covenant Crucible or to laugh at the fact that I'm pretty sh I'm pretty sure I will reach retirement age before blo before Vampire Bloodlines Two comes out. <laughs> the, the oh the yeah! <laughs> As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. 
But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!